Here of In the Flex, How Google Thinks, Works, and Shapes Our Lives, a hot new book that chronicles the phenomenon of Google and in conversation with Kara Swisher of all things D. Stephen and Kara, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank and I would also like to thank Fenwick and West for opening their doors to us this morning as host and sponsor. Thank you, Fenwick. Also to our members for your tremendous support and participation in the Churchill Club. We could not do what we do without you. And if you are not a member this morning and you enjoy our program, please do consider joining us. Our next event is next week on April 27 as we test your leadership body language IQ. Um, also coming up is our popular Top 10 Tech Trends event on May 25th. And Xerox CEO Ursula Burns in conversation with Forrester CEO George Colony on June 29. These are both members only events. We have other programs in the works for you, so please do keep an eye on our website at churchillclub.org. And my last announcement those of you who are tweeting will find Twitter codes in your printed program. Please use Town Churchill Club if you're tweeting so that everyone can follow along. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Kara Swisher, who will then introduce our guest of honor. Kara, of course, writes the popular Boomtown blog on the All Things Digital <coughs> website, allthingsd.com, which she runs together with Walt Mossberg and together they produce the unique and influential annual technology conference, All Things Digital, well known as D. Kara has been a wonderful friend to the club for many years and we're always honored to welcome her back. Please say hello to Kara Swisher. Excellent. I want to leave time for questions because you guys have, I'm sure, better questions than I could. But I have some good ones. Um, so let's start first by introducing Stephen. I've known Stephen forever, pretty much. Pretty um, much yeah. There's very few um, elderly, as I call ourselves, uh, tech writers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and by that I mean right in there. By that, <laughs> by that I mean you've been around for a long time. Um, not that you're old. You look fabulous. Um, so I want to start off uh, talking about. You've done so many books, and uh, in, uh, your work for, by the way, Stephen works for Wired now, um, and, and it's worked for many, many great publications over the years. Uh, but one of the things he's done is he's written how many books? Seven. Seven books. And the first one was about? Hackers. Which is about hackers. And then the, the iconic one that he wrote was about Steve Jobs, I would say. Well, the, there was a, actually there was one about the Macintosh. Right. And Stanley Gray. Right, exactly. And so what... what Google's been around for a while, and uh, it has been really important. What was the impetus for writing the book? So I always thought that Google was a pretty fascinating company. And I had been clued on to them pretty early on. In 1998, I think I saw the, the search engine, and mentioned it in Newsweek in February 1999. And as that year went on, it became clear to me that it was more than just a cool thing on the web but it was going to be an important company too because it was one of those technologies that not only uh, was transformative for the user, but actually was changing the landscape itself. Just like the interstate highway uh, made it easy for drivers, it also changed the landscape by letting things spring up around where the highways were, right? And in this case, uh, things sprang up because uh, they knew that they could be found so people would start websites they never would have started. So it really pushed the whole web. So I wanted to go see these people. I'm called up there then uh, communications head, Cindy McCaffrey, and said, uh, I want to come to town and meet these people. And I remember clearly it was October 1999, because when I went there, uh, everyone was in costume. And uh, Larry was dressed like a Viking. He had a big furry vest and a hat with big horns coming out of it. And Sergey was dressed like a cow. Uh, he had this breastplate, this plastic udders sticking out of it. And the Viking and the cow took me into a room and described page rights to me. So as... Those wacky Google. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, so obviously, in the next few years, Google became bigger and bigger and had an IPO. And it was getting to be book worthy. But then around the IPO time, other people had written a book. So I figured, I'm not going to write a book about it unless I have something unique to bring to it. And in the summer of 2007, I was invited to go on this trip uh, along with these uh, people at Google who were called uh, APMs, Associate Product Managers, which is this leadership program they have where they take people just out of college or graduate school and or very you know early in the workforce and make them into Google managers. They were the future leaders of Google. And halfway through this program, Marissa Mayer, 
who is a, a woman Google executive, takes them on a trip internationally where they go to offices around the world and learn about markets around the world and talk to other Googlers. And they invited me to come along to this trip for uh, 16 days. We literally went around the world. We started in San Francisco, went to Tokyo, Beijing, Bangalore, and Tel Aviv. And being around Googlers 24-7, I realized there was a dimension of the company that I hadn't seen, I'd never seen written about, that you know, it was you know, a, a different, unique company, and one which actually, if you learned about it, you'd be learning not only about an interesting approach to management, to culture, a corporate culture, and to technology, but a glimpse into the future itself. So I thought, if I could write a whole book with that kind of access, that would be something different. That would be something worth doing. Mm -hmm. And I asked permission of the poobahs of Google, uh, Larry, uh, Sergey, and Eric, and they said okay. So that's what I did. Now, you're working on another book, correct? Um, or you have been thinking, and you talked about it in the book party the other day. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, during the time around the IPO thing, I was working on uh, a book about the iPod. Mm -hmm. So that was another disincentive to you know, do it back then. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's more interesting now because <clears throat> Uh, you know, since then, since that, that period where those first uh, couple books appeared in you know, 2004, 2005, uh, Google done gone into phones and video, and and then has had this period uh, where uh, their size uh, became an issue and their public perception changed. So I was hanging around Google a whole lot during the last couple of years when that shift occurred, and it was interesting to watch to see how Google dealt with it and how the world dealt with Google. All right. So how many years did you work on this book? I began uh, the, the serious work on the book in June 2008. 2008. 2008, yeah. And so it was a little over two years before I had my intro. All right, we'll talk about what's happening now, but let's go back to the, the beginnings. I mean, you did open on that trip to, the awkward trip, to when you had right. them in, in the Indian village where the Googlers said, let's go meet people. Right. Um, and the Indian uh, village that came out to greet them didn't know who, what Google was. Right. Um, and so ever the enthusiastic people that they are, Google, you know, tried to let them know who they were. Um, why do you, I'm curious why you opened with that. I was, I was interested. We, what was we were trying to get out? We were talking about this idea of right. writing about it differently. This guru's been written about incessantly for mm -hmm. the past decade by all kinds of reporters and mentioned in lots of books. What was different from what you were trying to approach it as? You, you well, obviously yeah. didn't want to write a fan book. Right, no, right, no, no. I mean, it, it, was, it was an interesting moment there because it was, you know, were, were people who were just, you know, totally enveloped in, in one kind of culture came into contact with a, a, a culture that was as different as you could imagine. This was an Indian village that, you know, one of their big problems we learned was, was the, the elephants would trample on their crops, right? And, you know, uh, uh, yet, uh, and they, they had no, not one personal computer in the entire village, yet they did have phones, and they weren't smartphones yet, but, you know, I, I imagine probably they are now. So, uh, to me, at the end of that, the little kick, the kicker of that section is that they, this guy, the, one of the young managers approached, the, the, didn't quite know what he was talking about, the young manager, when he said, you know, Google, but then he, they said internet, and he picked up the phone there. And that indicated to me that everyone, this village was going to be Googled, mm -hmm. was going to come into their world there. And this culture of Google would affect this remote culture of an Indian village that really only recently got electricity. So uh, it, it, it sort of was the opening note uh, to really the, the, uh, one of the themes of the whole book that this culture there has an impact on all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly we know the impact because of where we are, but worldwide it, it also is going to have its effect there. So this is worth reading about. And also, of course, introduce the idea of this, of this trip, which is why I try to explain how it will get about. So let's talk about this culture. This, it isn't a unique culture. It's a, a strange culture. It's an odd culture. There's lots of aspects to it. Um, how do you, uh, despite the costumes, which I think is just for show, um, what, um, what, what do you think is different about it and how, in, in Silicon Valley? Because there's been all kinds of odd right. cultures and odd companies in Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, they try to de-whack, you know, over-whacking each other, uh, that kind of thing. What is different from this group, would you say, in the initial stages of when it was created? Well, a lot of, you hear uh, a lot of idealistic statements from early, very early stage companies there. But in, in Google, I, I think 
in, in retrospect, we can look back and, and take it more, more seriously because uh, from what's happened since, we can see that they were more sincere about executing these ideals. You know, everyone says, they start a company and say, well, we want to change the world, even if the company uh, has some you know, obscure business to business practice or something like that. You know, they say, no, we're, this is a revolution, we're going to change the world. But, but in this case, first of all, they had a technology which was you know, very perceptibly impactable. I mean, you can see that, you know, how uh, powerful it was just by typing something in the search engine and, and, and getting it. But they were also uh, stating pretty, pretty broadly a couple of ideals. One of them was, you know, Larry Page in particular says, you know, I'm doing this because I, I want to benefit the world. Technology can benefit the world. He's very big on ambition and very disappointed <coughs> that more people aren't more ambitious because he believes, and I think there's something to this, that we're at a point in history where technology makes possible things that previously were thought of ridiculous and, and, and impossible, really. And he is disappointed that people don't get that more. Why don't people push harder on the impossible? Because this amazing platform of technology makes things that we are conditioned to think is impossible actually possible. So, and, and this is, you can point to different things that Google's done throughout history, which shows that, you know, where, where he attempts to do these things, these moonshots and things like that. And this was in their minds from early, early on. And also the, the idea of using artificial intelligence to address these things in, in, in a serious way. Really early on, you, you see that, I saw a tape of their very first press conference that they gave in 1999 where they got their venture capital money. They're talking artificial intelligence. I went back. I was there. I wrote, yeah. I wrote that story for the yeah. journal. Um, I went back to uh, some early interviews I did. And fortunately, even though I began the book in 2008, I had been covering Google for Newsweek as, you know, as soon as after that 1999 visit. Google was really one of the top companies I covered, along with Apple and Microsoft, for my last eight years at Newsweek. So uh, I had a lot of interviews with them. And in 2002, 2004, I'm sitting there with Larry and Sergey. They're talking artificial intelligence. Larry even mentioned an, an implant. Semi seriously, I don't know. Uh, but but when, when you put in your head, and it would give you Google, and you know, and have, have the AI built in there. So these actually were pillars of the Google culture. Also. Other things about the Google culture were unique is, that, is the company that's probably most aligned culturally with the way the internet works. So, so what are the core Google values? I tell you, the speed is mom and scale is apple pie at, at, at Google. And those are things that are not only baked into their approach to technology, but in, in, in the culture as well as maybe things we could talk about. So when you get to that culture, it is a different culture, but give, give me some of the aspects of running a company of that culture. Obviously, they're most famous for the Don't Be Evil right. essay that they did. Um, I have a little bit of experience with that because Larry actually tried to get me to write it. He ended up getting Jim Fallows to write it with mm -hmm. him. Um, I was covering Google and he wanted me to write it. and didn't quite understand why it was unethical for me to do so, um, which was odd. Um, but talk, talk a little bit about that idea because people, it was roundly mocked later and every time they did something evil. Um, it got pointed to. Right. Talk about the idea of a little bit, right, felt a little bit righteous, a little bit arrogant also well, at the same yeah. time was interesting. Right. So I, I went back, I talked to a number of people who were that <coughs> where don't don't be evil, you know, uh, originated there. And it was something it was actually a suggestion of Bo Campbell, who was an advisor to Google, uh, that the people sit down and try to, you know, delineate their values there. And the head of uh, HR, uh, Stacy Sullivan, uh, gathered a, a group of people, you know, plucked from different parts of Google. It was a relatively small company then, a few hundred people. And they sat in, in Charlie's Cafe in, 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 at, at Bayshore, and she had, a, you know, an easel with some paper, and she wrote down things. And some of the things were platitudinous that, that they were coming up with. And then Paul Buckheit was an early engineer, the creator of uh, Gmail, said, this is all ridiculous. You know, everything, the values of Google would be summed up in, in one phrase, don't be evil. And Stacey Sullivan, she recalled a little of that. She thought it was a little too negative sounding, that, you know, to propose something that what well, we shouldn't be. Um, but after the meeting, uh, another person attending, an engineer named Amit Patel, uh, you know, thought well, this was really worth promulgating throughout the company. So on all the whiteboards, there's a lot of whiteboards around Google, he kept writing, 
uh, Don't Be Evil. It was a very distinctive uh, script, and, you know, and people could see it. It was almost like Kilroy was here. Don't Be Evil. And it caught on within the company. It was almost like a secret handshake. That When they would talk about something, they would say, well, that's evil. You know, let's not do this. And, but a turning point came when Eric Schmidt shared that phrase with uh, a writer from Wired, not me. And at that point, Sydney McCaffrey told me, she said, I knew then we were in big trouble. That this was going to be used as a bludgeon against us for everything we do. And indeed, it was. Yet, surprisingly, when I interviewed people for this book, you know, the Google executives who had been there for a long time, they would not say, wow, what a mistake that was, don't be evil. They still thought it, it had value. It had value for them as they pursued you know, the, the courses that they, they took during you know, the, the 2000s. And it also, even though people don't say now at meetings, people don't, you, know, you, don't, you never hear people at a meeting say, oh, well, we, our motto is don't be evil, we shouldn't do this. Uh, people tell me that that is something that is in people's heads to, to a certain degree. Now, you can judge how well they do and following that by the, the, the things they do. But I was actually surprised to find people um, at, at Google who would uh, just straight up did not disavow this, but continue to embrace it. Just to finish up on culture, what other aspects of culture uh, right. have been uh, good for them and which have been bad? In well, one, one thing I do talk about, actually, at the back of the book, where you know, Mercer Mayer told me, you can't understand Google unless you understand the book Larry and Sergey or Montessori kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, Montessori education, uh, actually, I wound up reading a book by Maria Montessori, so I can understand this better, uh, is based very much on follow, on the idea that you learn and you know and get more out of what you're doing. You pursue things you're passionate about that you want to do. So Larry and Sergey, in particular, like to follow parts of the com company that they like the most, and they don't like to be pinned down to things. And I think that's reflected in Google culture. You have this 20% uh, in theory, a uh, scheme where you can spend one day a week doing something that no one gave you permission to do, you can just do, but uh, more also just the way the, the engineers can, in a, in a project, can, you know, do what they think is the interesting thing, the product manager can't tell them what to do, and there is this um, uh, creative disorganization which Google consciously embraces that I think springs from that Mont Mont Montessori principle there. So. Uh, and, and it's interesting, on the other hand, there is you know, this mania of measuring things and metrics. So I was surprised to learn of a number of systems the companies installed internally uh, that, that, that keep track of things, you know, that sort of go as a counterpoint to this Montessori you know, disorganization, creative chaos business. Uh, there's one thing called OKRs. And you know, uh, I'm sure you know pretty much about OKRs. You know, Why don't you explain it? Yeah, yeah. But uh, Andy Grove invented this thing. It's called Objective Key Results, and he in installed it at, at Intel. And he writes about it in his book. But when John Doerr introduced it to Google, uh, they went crazy on it. And that, that's basically you set your objectives and in a measurable way. You do it by quarter. You do it by year. And uh, and and Google has this old. Uh, you know, documented, it's on everyone's you know uh, profile in the internal uh, website. You can look at everyone else's OKRs, and you know you see how well you do. You know, did I meet my OKR this quarter? Uh, and the interesting thing is, of course, if you meet your OKR every quarter, every year, you're doing something wrong because you, know, you must be might, be might be sandbagging. You're not being ambitious enough. So I've been told that the proper way to meet your OKRs. Instead of getting like a 1, which means you've done it, it's get like a, like a maybe a 0. 0.6 or a 0. 0.7, which shows, you know, you're, you're, you're getting stuff done, but you set really high goals for yourself. Oh, great. So it's like gray padding. Yeah, well, sort, sort of. Yeah, interesting. Um, so let's talk about um, the key moments at Google's history. I want to get to the present because it's, what's happening now is probably the, mo the most interesting part mm -hmm. of their history. But what are the key moments from your perspective uh, in there? In what was really important to getting differentiated? Because right. when they were started, you know, there were a lot of search engines. And, right. and many people made fun of the fact that another one was funded by two very prominent firms, Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia Capital, mm -hmm. who had never really funded stuff together, right. which was unusual at the time. Um, so people, you know, were very doubtful about its mm -hmm. prospects. Um, but what do you what do you think the key moments in its it, it, that brought it to right. the forefront? Right. Well, one one key moment is that 
uh, and I, I won't dwell on this too much because you know th th I think uh, people are fairly familiar with this. Is, you know, er early on, there was this idea you know, floating around in, 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 in the air at that time, that for waiting for the right brilliant person to grab it, that you could find things better on the web by links, right? And Larry Page had that idea, but also a guy who was spending a, a, a summer uh, fellowship at IBM before he went off to his academic career at Cornell had the same idea. And a third person had the same idea, who later uh, founded the uh, search engine Baidu in China, you know, all around the same period of time. But Google was the one which built it in, in, into a search engine there. Um, uh, another less well-known turning point for Google was in between 1999 and 2001, Google hired a number of people who it had no business, a small company like that has no business hiring. Really great computer scientists, largely who dealt with uh, artificial intelligence, and, but also uh, dealing with things in scale, uh, uh, you know, or uh, information retrieval. Uh, normally they would never go to a tiny company. I mean, this is like less than 20 people, you know, where some of them joined there. And uh, that was because you know, Larry pursued these people. It was a great time to do it. There had just been a tech bust. And a number of research labs uh, had been having these moments where you know, uh, their future w w was in question. In particular, the DEC research lab here uh, you know, up, up at the road in Palo Alto uh, was in a, a, a pretty bad shape because uh, it had been bought by Compaq, and then Compaq was bought by HP. So there were two steps of not invented here, right? So it was very difficult for the engineers. They hired this guy, one guy in particular named Jeff Dean, who it doesn't mean the name doesn't mean anything to a lot of people, but in that community, he was like a rock star. It was like your local basketball team hiring Kobe Bryant, right? And then people said, "Wow, Jeff Dean went to Google." So then these are the people that really took this search engine from a graduate student product to something that scaled out largely, and they built the infrastructure that Google would grow to. And actually, a surprising number of those people are still there. I used to call it the, the Museum of Computer Scientists, a yeah. famous uh, prize-winning scientist. You'd walk yeah. around, and they'd yeah. pop out of doors. These crazy, right. sort of usually crazy men yeah. used to pop out right. of doors, mm -hmm. and they'd say, oh, yeah. this person from this giant. Right. And then, then, of course, maybe the most important moment of all was when Google invented AdWords. And this was something with, it, where uh, really, uh, out, of, out of nowhere, they not only came up with a way to make money, they came up with a way to make money that met their ideals. Larry and Sergey did, don't, didn't like advertising the, the way it was on the web. And they turned it over uh, to one of their early employees named Salar Kamanjar. Um, I know I'm saying his name right. I've, I've never heard a Googler pronounce it because they were just so Salar, right? And uh, who was a, you know, really an important person there. And he worked with an engineer named Eric Veach, who also really hated advertising. You know, uh, and passionately uh, to come up with a system that not only was effective and it worked really well because it works during search when people are actually looking for things or open to buying things, but it worked in, in a way which is confusing to a lot of people. I hope to decode it in there uh, because, for I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but as it turns out, advertisers pay less for ads that are good. So, therefore, people who use the system are happier with it. Indeed, Google periodically measures their happiness by showing people in tests pages of search results without advertising, and people search more when they see the normal pages with advertising there. And it's this amazing system where there is a, a virtuous triangle where the user gets as much out of it as the advertiser or Google. Uh, and that was amazing, and that basically financed everything Google did from then on. So uh, that enabled all the other stuff. Another important thing, people don't remember, they were actually Yahoo's uh, search engine for a long yes. time, and they gained a lot of um, uh, traffic then for the Google. Right, yeah, Udi Mamber, who was the person at Yahoo in charge of this, he had been urging his employers to develop their own search engine, to take on you know, the, the, these people at Google. They would only give them a few engineers, and you know, they didn't think it was very important. And at one point, he was uh, asked to you know, uh, to see who was going to be our, our next search engine. Their contract with Ignomi was up, and they had to pick, uh, you know, whether to stick with Ignomi or look at, at Excite or Google or any other competitors in, in, in that field there. And he picked Google, and it was actually great for Google because one of the things they did was they demand Google update its index every month, and, and that was a great incentive for Google to build out its system. Uh, but, and then what happened was that uh, search 
you know, over double on Yahoo after they, they did that. And you think that people at Yahoo will be happy, but instead they were angry. They said, like, you know, we're not we want to pay Google too much now. You know, so they, they didn't like that, the idea that people were searching more on Yahoo. There. So um, now, of course, now, of course, Woody works for Google. Yeah, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> at the time, I went to visit uh, 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 Larry when it was a very small company, and they used to put the, the things on paper around the room about how big their traffic was. And they would actually, with crayons, of course, because they're children. Um, and they, uh, they were showing the growth on Yahoo, Google on Yahoo, which was going really well. And then they had Google.com, which was all of a sudden when you looked around the room, you could see it growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And it was visually arresting to see what was about to happen because Yahoo had done the same thing to Netscape many years before. And I looked at him and I said, do they know? And Larry went, no. And I said, he goes, don't tell them. I said, no, I'm going to tell them. <laughs> and uh, I called Terry Yang and I said, get them off your surface yeah. immediately. They're doing what you did to Netscape. And Jerry was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, something like that. But it was interesting <laughs> that they built their... <laughs> You know, their, their brand upon, upon that. Let's talk really quickly about the brand, the idea of the brand, because that was an important uh, part of the, you know, the colorful letters, um, the, the simplicity, and things like that. And then we'll get into the present, because I think that's okay. important, what's happening now. Right. Well, a lot, of, a lot of the brand was done ad hoc, really. I mean, I, they, didn't, they didn't care and spend a lot of time about brand management. I mean, you, know, you talk about Yahoo. I remember I did a story and about Yahoo for Newsweek in 1998. And that was what they put as their first foot forward. We're branding, we're branding. We have the Zamboni at the Sharks game, right? You know, that says Yahoo, and, and, you know, and they had a big branding manager. And I mean more the simplicity of the page. Yeah, the, the that came design. simply because, you know, Sergey, you know, was playing with a, an open source, you know, graphics program, and he, and he cooked it up. Um, you know, Larry assured me it was, you know, a big factor, and they were how quickly it would load, right? And that was the, the simplicity there. And it wasn't a question of design genius, it was a question of efficiency. Um, but also, people talk a lot about the Google interface, and people who are design-oriented are often quite critical of it. Um, but what, the way it was explained to the designers there that made them understand it was uh, that Google has to be designed, you know, as a look like, almost like a machine designed it, because we want to convey that we're not biased and our search results. There's not a, a big editorial presence here, picking losers and winners at what comes up. Uh, it's our algorithms there. So they want that implicit message to come through. I don't think that was something they thought of early on when they, when they first designed it. But later on, as the temptation came up to make it full of swooshes and, you know, and filigrees and animations and things well, like that. Well, they do that now a lot. Well, yeah, a little more. But, um, but still, you know, every so often, some <laughs> designer will, you know, like stomp off and, and say, like, you know, they, they, I can't work at this place. They, they don't like artists. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this is Google's explanation. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about, um, what, one more question about the past. What's the most surprising thing that you found out that, ha that, that hadn't been written about? To you, what was the most surprising right. for you as an author? Well, I guess to me, and this is a whole lot of other things, you know, that in, in, the, in this category was the, the, the China stuff. Um, you know, I did a, a whole big section on China. I definitely wanted to talk about Google International. I think in general, <laughs> reporters don't write enough, American reporters don't write enough about the international operations of the companies they cover, and almost always, which is a half of what they do is international. So I did want to write that, and I thought I'll concentrate on one place, and you know, uh, one obvious place seemed to do it was China, and that turned out to be actually, uh, to me, uh, one of the most interesting you know, parts of it. And I learned a lot which hadn't been reported in, in China, and you know, the story, as always, when you really dig into something, is much more interesting than you get sort of piecemeal from, 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 from things here and there. So uh, a, a lot of the things in, in, in China were surprising to me and illuminating. And that, that story, is almost, my wife told me it's almost a book in itself. Yes. Is, uh, is what happens there. Well, everyone's facing that same in their different ways. Yeah, yeah. But the Google experience had so many you know, elements in it because it really was a, a, a case where you know, idealism, to some point naivete, uh, came into contact with, I, I, you can even say evil, right? Um, and evil, yeah. And, uh, and, and Google made a number. Uh, besides, you know, the, the original uh, fall, you know, from, from, from grace of uh, censoring the search engine, Google made a number of missteps, some of which could have been avoided, other of which uh, were probably inevitable, uh, but it was a great cautionary story. Yesterday I was at Facebook, 
and I decided to spend most of my talk actually talking about Google's experience in China as a cautionary tale because they've been reported to be thinking of going into a partnership with Baidu or something or, or having a big presence in, in, in China. And I just wanted to give them a taste of what they might be in for. Mm -hmm. I suspect they're not as idealistic, perhaps. Maybe not. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure of it. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, so in terms of um, today, let's talk about today. Um, Google has. China was a stumble for them in a lot of ways. It was difficult. It was a difficult time internally at the company. And right. And I, so I'd like to say I, I do admire their resolution of it, that they did pull out there. And, you know, to be honest, I was disappointed with Microsoft's response when Google pulled out. I thought it was a really easy shot for Microsoft to say at that point, you know, we understand why Google left because we struggle with these issues every day. That's what I would have said if I were. Yeah, because you know, Microsoft's so well known instead, for not taking easy shots. Instead, you know, Microsoft, I mean, easy shot to, to stay above the fray. Yeah. Instead, they took a shot. They, they said, you know, well, that just shows those people at Google, we, we, we're a good company because we respect the laws of China, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, you know, and, you know I, I had sat in this hearing, congressional hearing in 2006. And this was the one where representatives from Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Cisco had to stand up there and lift their hands up like they were tobacco executives or mobsters <laughs> and, uh, and, and listen to Tom Lantos, the, uh, the only congressional you know, representative who had ever been a Holocaust survivor, you know, evoke the example of IBM and the Holocaust to them and ask each one of you, are you ashamed? Are you ashamed? And you know, after that, somehow, Using it as a defense that we respect the laws of a, a dictatorship doesn't seem like a great explanation for what you do. Right. And there all those companies are. Just, yeah. you know, they continue to do. Um, that was the one where Jerry Yang got particularly pilloried for. Yeah, Yahoo, yeah. Of course, it wasn't Yang himself who no. stood up there. but. Yeah. So um, he did later. He, he, he was later. later. Yes, he was. He, he was in it. Yeah. Right. It was not pretty. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about today. Okay. Much more difficult situation for Google. Every tech company hits this moment. Uh, I think it's fair to say Google has hit its moment. Right. Um, well, you have to be pretty successful to hit this oh, moment. Oh, no, That's no. Really, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it, so is Microsoft's very yeah. successful. I think most people yeah. think they have some issues. Right. You know, they're in a deeper, longer term right. uh, problem with it. So it's not, it's not unusual for this to happen. But what do you think the key issues facing Google right now are? So there's a, there's a number of them. One is that it's a company that really thrives on nimbleness and this kind of disorganization, yet it's a huge company. And Google is constantly struggling with its uh, willful non-acceptance of its size. Right? So there's a lot of really smart people at Google, but in a sense, their future depends on their ability to defy gravity and not be pulled down by their size and bureau bureaucracy that inevitably creeps in there. And this is what Larry, the past and current CEO, uh, is very consciously grappling with that. To try to you know, uh, make Google a company like that he had originally envisioned it to be, even though it's huge, and you, there's a lot of stuff that just comes with that, and it's impossible to ignore. The other threat, um, as you know, we all know, of course, is that there is this social networking thing. Going yeah, I've heard on of there. it. Yeah, yeah and uh, Google. It's somewhat of a Facebook panic now, and I think that the, the reason is, and you know, it makes sense, that Facebook has all this information. People choose to share with Facebook a lot of information about their interests and who their contacts are and what they're doing, and this is information that Google doesn't have access to. And the more this information grows that Google doesn't have access to, the less able Google is to deliver the information to its users. And, you know, and, from search and, and, and from other things as well. So Google's you know, very, very concerned about that and is mobilizing you know, quite a lot. And uh, we've learned that next year's bonus depends on how well Google does in social networking. And of course, so, we, we've learned it, but I, I don't even know if Google's officially confirmed it yet, but it, it, it seems to be the case. So this idea of, of information, it can't, I, always, uh, I was talking to a pretty high Google executive, and they were going on about Facebook needs to be open, and how dare they not right. be open. And I said, well, you're like the Borg who can't eat something. who They don't want right. to let you eat them. And you know, they were saying, oh, it would be so beneficial for the world, for Google to be able to, uh, to use Facebook data. And I said, well, it would be beneficial to Google, for sure. Right. Maybe well, not I was at Facebook yesterday. So the first question I get 
from the face, a Facebook person was, when is, or is Google going to sit down and have a rapprochement with us and share its information with us and, you know, and sit down and table with us? I thought that's what Google's going to ask you. I mean, so basically we're in a position now where these two companies that we share information with, and I actually do think, you know, Google is better at sharing information. Of course, they're not in the same position as Facebook. So, you know, you really can't uh, <coughs> say they have equal incentive to, to, to share or, or to keep things private, let's say. Uh, but I think as, as someone who's caught in the middle, information I willingly share with these companies I should be able to, if I give the okay, to export that information and use it in any other service I want. That's, that's the way I feel that users have a right uh, to, to do. So I'm, I'm actually impatient with both companies, and you know, in, in terms of personal information, a little more with Facebook, really, uh, about their you know, willingness to let me do what's fair with, with this information there. But for Google asking for it, do you well, think there will be? Well, of course, Google's self-interest is that. But, but in terms of that happening, do you see that happening? I don't see that happening. I think that's the ultimate. Uh, to me, though it hasn't been expressed in these terms, it would seem to be the ultimate goal of Google's social initiative to bring Facebook to the table, to come up with something on its own where they have information that could make Facebook better, and Facebook would be forced partly that, and partly maybe due to pressure. You know, Facebook is going to have the regulatory pressure. One thing. Other factor that Google today is obviously the regulatory pressures and it, it, it's under uh, in antitrust. But that Facebook would then sit at the table. If they could come up with stuff that people adopt enough, that Facebook you know says, well, you know, their information will make us better. Uh, we'll sit at the table with them, sharing information is going to the end of Facebook. Then I think that would be good for everyone, and by, and certainly good for Google. I think that's what Google really wants. Right. Will that happen? Because it seems more of a when you talk to them. I guess that depends on the success of Google's product. <coughs> so talk about their prices. One of the things, sometimes I think, is is social to Google what search has been to Microsoft, or an endless uh, right. slog through a horrible war that they're never going to win. Yeah, in the book I talk about a number of attempts that Google's made in the social space. And for not one single reason, but different reasons for each product, uh, they haven't taken off. I mean, some of them have been real you know, clear flops. Uh, why is that? I, I have a perspective, but why do you think that is? You know, I actually, I sort of reject the idea that, you know, that Google's this computer science engineering company, they don't understand social. I mean, if you talk to the people at Facebook, they're not like the warmest sharing people in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, you know, they're engineers like Google is engineers, you know. But, uh, you know, I think uh, it just wasn't a high enough priority in, in, in the past. They let things slip. They're, some of the, 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 the Google ways of releasing products uh, isn't good for the products. You know, they'll put out a product sometimes. Sometimes it'll be a pretty good product and they won't support it. Or they'll have something wrong with it. They won't even bother to fix it um, if it isn't adopted widespread. Do you, do you imagine it's slightly generational? A little bit? They're a, li they're a little somewhat older. generational, yeah. yeah. Obviously, Larry and Sergey are gener a whole generation apart from that. And I don't think they're big participants they're not. in social things like that. I know that every so often Sergey comes up in my Facebook, you know, do you want to be his, be his, be his friend there? Uh, Larry never does. I don't even know if he has a Facebook uh, account. Does, does there's, there's probably a fake Larry. Yeah, um, but, but there's, Sergey has one. It's not, not Sergey Brin, but, um, and I don't know how much he uses it. Most uh, of the Google executives don't use Twitter, don't use Facebook, don't use I, I'm friends with a lot on, on but Facebook. But I'm just saying, they're yeah. not active. They're, they're not, not active yeah. No, no, no. But uh, it's, uh, I think they're a little more now. I've seen them appear a little more now that they're, you know, Although that can sometimes feel like an old person listening to, you know, hip hop kind of thing. Right, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, in Silicon Valley, people, you know, it, it, it's not a generational thing. A lot of people in Silicon Valley who are, you know, over 30, over 40, even over 50, are using Facebook. Of course Facebook. they do. That's but, our I, but, I'm wondering, but I'm trying to get it. Is there something within that company? You were saying it's not because yeah. just because they're computer scientists, very interested in scientific. Well, because research. I think the information that was available, that, 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 that was generated there, was thought as a, a corpus that was as important to you know to, to, to work on there. Again, I think that it, 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 once the level, the value of the information rose, that they they caught on. This is something we we have to do there. So what do yeah, they like they're not big readers. You know, Larry and Sergey aren't big readers, yet they appreciate the value of the corpus of books, and that became a huge thing for them to pursue. Right, uh, as information, as information pieces. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they respect that that that, that information. Well, but the, you know, their um, idea of a fun evening isn't curling up the good book. Right. So talk about that idea of the, this. Even book. my book. So do you imagine? <laughs> that, have they read their, your book? Sergey, I ran to Sergey uh, like last weekend. He apologized for not reading it yet. So <laughs> it, I guess it implies he might read it. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me what I was doing. He said, "Why don't you just release us a chapter of time on the internet?" You can right? definitely rip it apart and have it in the Google system at some point. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that. He'll eat it. Um, uh, that's an interesting topic. Let me finish up with social. So the idea, and then we'll get to some questions too uh, before we end. Um, do you imagine they're going to get social? Um, I think that they're going to do better in social than they have in the past. I think, um, I, and to be honest, I, I just don't know the answer to that. I do know that there is, you know, uh, great people working on it. And they're they're dedicated at, at this time, um, but you know, you know, there, there's there's zillions of factors that are going to determine this. Um, one will be uh, avoiding a blunder like they did with Buzz when Buzz came out. You know, they have to get it right this time. Uh, with Buzz, which is a product that came out with one big privacy flaw, uh, that actually was fixed relatively quickly, uh, but it. You know, that, that stumble out of the gate of, uh, you know, that they lost the race. Everyone, you know, <laughs> ran past them and, you know, they, they couldn't catch up in time. You know, so even though the product, I think, is still alive, uh, no one at Google thinks that that's, you know, a, a product that's going to be around in a few years. All right. So uh, let's talk about uh, regulatory issues and then Larry Page being CEO of the shift over. Okay. And then we'll get some quick questions from people. Um, where, where, how do you look at this? Is this a huge threat from your perspective? It's a reality. I mean, it's not a, a, like a threat to Google's you know, uh, uh, existence, but it's something that Google's going to have to live with for you know, pretty much the rest, the rest of its history, as Microsoft does. Uh, and I think they acknowledge that. You know, when they so they go after the, the, the travel site, the TA, right? And uh, this is a travel site that provides information to their competitors there. So in a way, I actually think it's sort of a positive sign that they went after it, even knowing that it was going to be a regulatory slog to get through. I guess one thing that, that and IBM found this out, is that if you're under constant scrutiny, uh, that there's a temptation not to do things, and they, even if they, they, would, they would help your company there. So in some cases, uh, you give up things. Actually, one reason why Google didn't buy Skype was because the product manager who sabotaged the deal, actually the crusade of one person at last minute sabotaged that purchase, and one reason was that he was working on a product which would be integrated with Skype, and he didn't want the whole project stalled for another year while they went through the regulatory regimen there. Mm -hmm. But in the, the ITA thing, you know, they accepted these uh, you know, uh, extended scrutiny and of, of what they do and oversight, uh, which is something new for Google. And you know, I think, in a way, it's a recognition that from here on in, you know, this is going to be our life. And a few years ago, they didn't want to admit that. They, they thought that you know, people would look at their model and just conclude, because you can go one click away to some other search engine, uh, you know, sorry, Mr. Antitrust, uh, you, you should go away now. Nothing to see here. Move on. Right. Uh, but that isn't the case. Can you imagine a massive government case just like the Because the, the, there was a, pre, a post uh, Microsoft type of personality after the case and before it had changed the company. Yeah, yeah. The, um, well, it, it's tough. I mean, we have the search neutrality thing, uh, the fighting. So the one big case, really, would be you know ar around search. And I actually think Google's got a pretty good argument about that. And some judge uh, did make a ruling, you know, which is significant, that search results are opinion, just like a, a movie reviewer's opinion or a columnist's opinion. Uh, and if that holds, if that, if that holds up, it's really difficult, I think, to overturn you know, Google on that very core issue of, of, of search. Yet every single acquisition they make going forward is going to have the same kind of scrutiny there. What can't they buy? Um, that's interesting. I think the, well, um, they might be able to buy Twitter. You know, um, but uh, they couldn't, you know, like they couldn't buy Yahoo when, when, when Yahoo was up, up, up for sale. Right? So, you know, and in, 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 in search. Maybe today. Uh, what? Maybe today. Sometimes they get lucky, like when they wanted to buy um, AdMob, and Google bought, or Apple bought that, um, yeah. you know, what was it? 
you know, look at us. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Apple bought a, 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 a comp competing company, which took, took Google off the hook for that. That might have got turned down, I felt, yeah. if Apple had not bought. I think that. it certainly underwent a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. I, I ran into the founder on a plane uh, going to Washington, and he looked really dog tired from having to fly on the same plane back and forth. He didn't think it was going to go through, but then Apple did. Probably yeah. Make that yeah. So they, they, you know, there's a commotion there. Right. So what do you imagine they're going to buy? I, you know, I think Twitter, I mean, you know, you know we, we hear a lot about that. I think Twitter is just a natural for, for, for Google website. And, you know, I, I thought Groupon was, 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 I thought that Google got lucky by not buying Groupon. Yeah. Why is that? Hmm? I, I don't see that at first as something that Google could scale as easily. I thought that merging that stuff in with Google would probably lose what, 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 what it would have. It's not, it doesn't strike me as a very Googly company, really. Well, they do like to wear costumes, though. Well, okay, but you know, there's, there's, there's maybe at this point there's more to it than that. There was later hose in, in one picture, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, which is always a mistake. Um, so um, let's talk about Larry Page as the CEO. Okay. What is your assessment of his CEO? I think it's it, it, in in some aspects it's, it, it's going to be really good good for Google. He's you know he's come back, and it really happened on January 20th. He became the CEO mm -hmm. when it was announced, not when April 4th when the day it was. It was Formally going to happen, he, he he jumped right in. He started you know reorganizing, and I think that the the, the things he's he's doing are, are are things which are going to going to help Google. And I think that it, he he's going to bring focus to a lot of folks. And you know, can I, it looks like he's re, 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 refocused there. I think that um, there's part of the job though that is part of any CEO job that maybe he can brush off as easily, and he's getting a lot of flack for this now, is sort of dealing publicly. This was and, not appearing at the, the first quarterly or Yeah, but even before that, yeah. they, you know, Google did this big reorganization, and they, and they moved people around. And it was up to people like the Los Angeles Times and, and your publication, All Things D, to, you know, to explain to people, yeah. oh, you know, uh, you know, here's Google's new executive lineup, and, right. you know, and you said, you know, by the way, there's a different person in Google.org. Yeah. How did you know that? <laughs> Not and, Megan. Yeah. And, uh, and she declined to tell me that. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, what, I, I'd love to hear the circumstances of that. I interview. didn't write that story. Okay. I, know you, I know you didn't. I knew. But um, the. Yeah, uh, she came home and said, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. Okay. Yeah. Um, the. Yeah, but I, I think I, I'm still waiting. I, where, where's the sort of explanation? This is a great opportunity for Larry to come out and explain who he is. And you know, I had to pin down Larry for my really big interview for the book. And when I did, it was a fantastic interview. We talked for two hours, and then he walked away and came back and started telling me more. And you know, he, he is you know, actually he can be quite explicit. If you see him at the TGIFs, he can be quite witty. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite thing. The, the, the TGIF, I was there once, and a Googler very indignantly asked, how come there isn't enough Indian food in the, the cafes? You know, like, you know, we're running out of Indian food. And Larry thought for a minute and said, well, maybe the problem is that there isn't enough Indian food, but our chef makes it too good. Maybe if the chef didn't make such good Indian food, we'd have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny. That's funny. Um, um, but you imagine... So I, th I, think, I think that he has to, you know, uh, you know, Google's perception is a product. He's very product focused, and I think Google's perception is a product which is really important. Uh, we talked about the regulatory thing, and you know, uh, to the degree that the people feel comfortable with Google as you know a, 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 a company and, and, and Google's transparency, I think that would uh, pay off very much for in him. Washington. Because for better or worse, the CEO is often the focus of right, of, of, of right, but also really, yeah, yeah, I and mean, it would pay off for Google. I think he would do. Google a favor by uh, uh, being more open, even though it's not his favorite thing. Do you imagine he will? Because I think he has probably the lowest EQ level of any executive that I know. I think yeah. that I think he, he he could you know he can read the tea leaves. He, he he'll figure it out. Yeah. I, I I think that yeah yeah at a certain point if he if you can show him data which proves that it's affecting Google, he'll he'll, he'll do it. Interesting. We once had an argument about uh, he said he could control the press. He had figured it out <coughs> algorithmically or. Mathematically, <laughs> and what year was this? This was early on. He said, yeah, "I have a way yeah, to figure yeah. out how the press is going to react," and I figured it all out. And I'm like, "Good luck with that. Enjoy yeah, yourself." Yeah. I said, "Enjoy, enjoy dealing with disgruntled, angry people who just want to screw with you." Um, so, uh, and that's really mathematically able to do that. But, um, but in terms of, of, of his changes, and then we'll get, sorry, get to questions. A lot of the people that he moved around, he did definitely move people around, but they're the same people. Well, you know, in a way. 
And this is a, a, a point I made. I actually wrote a, a blog on called Kremlinology, of, you know, you know, uh, being a little critical of the uh, lack of uh, explanation that, that comes from Google. But the one point which, which I thought was really positive, you know, he made these all his executives re-up, re-enlist, because he said, you know, we're, next few years we're really going to redevote ourselves, and I don't want you here if you're not going to stick with me till, you know, through this, right? And Jonathan Rosenberg, one of his executives, um, you know, announced his that he was going to uh, retire from Google and said, well, because you know, I always wanted to be with my family when my daughter goes to college. Um, uh, and I do believe that was a little more complicated well, than, uh, been, than Google's explanation. Right, for it. right, right. But but anyway, but just the idea. Of, okay, so we, we we do know that he did, did this reenlistment thing, right? Um, yes. And some of the people that did reenlisted, because you would assume that all these senior vice presidents would reenlist, are people who've been at Google since very very early on. So you think about it, these people are richer than God. You know, they, they, they've been at Google since the very beginning. So yet they decided then I'm going to spend the next, what, two, three years of my life back here. So I think that really shows that they believe in Larry, mm -hmm. right? Why else would they, would they do that otherwise and say, I'm, I'm going to do this? It, it was a good time to say, you know, it, it's been great. You know, I'm, I'm going off to Hawaii or start my own company or, or, or whatever. Maybe they like Google after their name. Maybe like to go to Davos and be treated nice. I don't know. I'm just saying. It could be other. You could buy Davos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, not all of them. Um, anyway, let's get some questions from the audience um, right here. So then what do you think are the threats to Google's existence? What do you think they will look like in five or ten years? Okay, so what are the threats to uh, Google's existence? It really, you know, when companies like this uh, get un unhinged, it's when the next paradigm comes up, right? So uh, we haven't talked about this, but one threat to Google that they seem to have uh, gotten over was the move to mobile, right? Um, if you couldn't search use the Google search engine on mobile, that would have been devastating to Google because more people are going to search on mobile than they do on the desktops there. So that's really the, the, the big threat. Whether you, it could be social, I'm not quite sure if social is, a, is such a huge paradigm that that, that could unhinge Google, but even if it's not social, the next thing down the road, Google has to, has to own in order to, to keep going and, and, and do what it does. And it's a really, really difficult thing because we all know about the innovator's dilemma that Google not only is locked in the, cur the, the, the current paradigm, but it has a big stake in maintaining that paradigm for as long as possible, because that's where it makes its money there. So uh, in order to do that, they have to do the gravity-defying trick. Uh, so that, that, that's really the big threat, that the next thing that comes up uh, just doesn't fit their model, and you know they, they can't walk away from their revenues and to adopt the next thing. Do you imagine they're just going to not do social at some point? Or do you think? They, they, they keep half of doing it as, as, as it gets bigger. Yeah. They can't walk away. And then, you know, this thing, and I said in my book the first time, this project that's called Emerald Sea, mm -hmm. and it was named such because it was this painting by, um, you know, when they first came up with the idea, they, they, they saw this painting that came up in Google Images of this giant wave about to engulf a boat. And they said, well, it's very fitting because this wave of social, we're either going to be able to ride it to, you know, Greater, greater heights, and you know, or uh, get engulfed by it. And what are you? What is your feeling? As I said before, it, 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 it can go either way. Mm. I say engulf. Um, next, uh, next question. Another question. Second. Yeah, hi. The last time I was the last time I was over there, I was struck even more by how much. Uh, Google swag there is everywhere. Oh, I've never seen a corporate name in one room so many times. <laughs> and it happened to be a rainy day. They even had a sign that said Google umbrellas. Um, just seemed Orwellian. Could you speak to the internal branding? Yeah, you should come. You should come to my house. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they're they're they've, you know, they they've, they've gone you know, uh, totally all in on on swag and. Uh, I tell a story, um, actually Kai Fu Lee uh, wrote it in his book, he helped me, gave me a translation. This was Google's China. Yeah, when, when he came on, um, they sent him, you know, he was first in interviewed to lure him in there. They sent him, you know, almost like a truckload of stuff with not only the, you know, the, the shirts and the umbrellas and the hats, things like that, but it was like a gumball machine with Google on it and, you know, of course, lava lamps. Uh, that, you know, how many of them, is your home illuminated? I've only allowed one inside the house. 
Right, right. So, uh, it's in the basement. Yeah, so you know, swag is not new to the Silicon Valley, but you know, you're, you're, you're right. Google you know, uh, takes it to the It's bizarre. It is bizarre. I agree with you. Next question, there's one right here. Go ahead, Jill. Hey, Steve. Um, you made a comment about the 20% uh, stuff. Did, did you get the sense there that, that that works? Are there notable failures? Is that, is that going to stand the test of time? I think it's it's more like a, a, a principle than a, a firm um, thing there. So some people joke that it's 120 percent time because they <laughs> they do their 20 percent time. They still have to do everything else in, right. in their job. It's not like you know that people say, okay, you can do 80, your job at 80 percent. You know, uh, so but you know there's been a number of, of things. What happens is that if you pursue a project uh, in 20 percent time and it looks like a really good project for Google, that will be your 100 percent time. Uh, and, and move over there. And we've seen that in a number of things like Google News or, uh, or, or, or whatever. And, you know, a lot of people do spend their, what there's no, their 20 percent time, you know, working for the .org or, you know, in some, uh, you know, uh, feel good kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, so that's something that you can do, you know, if someone sees you, you know, kind of making posters for, you know, uh, to fight some disease during the day, then that's your 20 percent time. So, you know, people won't look at you weirdly. So. Uh, I think generally it, it works well. As a matter of fact, a lot of other places have adopted something like that. Uh, you know, to, to do that, even in journalism, people are adopting stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. If you work on your own product on the twenty percent of the time, do you know how the ownership structure works? I don't understand. You work the ownership structure. Ownership structure of your product. Yeah, of your own product. Yeah, on twenty percent of the time. Let's say I work on your own product on twenty percent of my time. Uh huh. How does the ownership? Work? Oh no no no! It's Google's. That's it, it, yeah. That, that's not your private thing. Of like you, you know, you go home and do it. You know, I guess if you go home and did it. Then maybe you can. I, I don't know how, how how your contract reads on, on that. But but this is working for Google. It's it's like saying, you know, that you get one day a week that you're working on a product that you choose, but it it's not your, you know, it's not like you're not working. You're still working for Google, and that that'll be a product that if it turns out something, it'll be a Google product. You get personal satisfaction person? doing yeah. it from Google. Well, you work there. It's, yeah, you develop a product that belongs to Google. Right. Uh, right here and then right there. Um, I kind of want to bring back to um, about China. Um, as China is growing tremendously within the next 20 years, how do you think Google's going to have to deal with that situation? I mean, it's inevitable that right. they to come back in. Right. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Right now, what's happened is, so they pulled their search engine. Or, or they said their search engine would stop censoring, and then they couldn't operate it, and they knew that this would happen within China without censoring. So they moved it offshore. You have to actively, if you're in China, you have to actively link to go to it. Sometimes it's blocked. Without this, the search engine is really the heart of Google. So without that, it's difficult to keep all the other products going well. And, and as what we've seen now, you know, China is just getting, you know, just increasingly, you know. Uh, uh, Sniping more and more about Google. They recently put out a thing that, uh, in the official you know, Chinese newspaper that compared to the East India Company. And, uh, you know, so it, I think that Google enters China again when China, when, if, if China you know, allows search engines to stop censoring, or maybe in 10 years the, the environment will be such that people just don't care anymore, or maybe the current leaders of Google don't care anymore, and they go back. You know, Sergey will be gone maybe in 10 years, and then they go back and say, well, we tried everyone else's censoring. What, 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 what difference would it make you know, with us? I don't know. But um, clearly, right now, uh, the prospects don't look good for a, big, a bigger Google presence in China. Yeah, probably will be a bigger Facebook one. Uh, just right here and then there, that one, the final three, two more questions. So right there and then here. Oh. So we've seen um, in the papers recently a lot of people defecting from Google to Facebook and Twitter and um, all the other new startups, whether it be for excitement or money. Um, does Google seem extremely concerned about this, yeah. and um, what might they be doing to stop the defection? Yeah, well, uh, obviously they're very concerned. Interestingly, at Facebook yesterday, someone asked me why more people haven't come from Google to Facebook. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting, because I asked at the beginning, like, how many people were from Google, and a bunch of hands went up. Except for it's a huge number. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I thought it was, I, I was an interesting, a weird question. But um, the, the problem Google has is that in their hiring process, <laughs> they s purposely select people who are the kind of people who are intolerant of big companies and bureaucracy. 
And you know, so what happens is that it's a big company, and of course there's some bureaucracy there. And when these people, you know, uh, get frustrated, uh, they want to go to a, a smaller company or a startup or, or something like that. So Google you know, has been. We've heard about these big bonuses they're giving, and clearly. One reason for their big operating expenses has been all this employee retention stuff. They gave everyone a raise. And uh, so it, 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 it's a very big concern. Now, obviously, you know, Microsoft still gets great resumes and things like that, but Google wants not resumes of the edgiest people, the, the risk takers there. So that, that's a continuing problem for them. What they have to do is convince those kind of people uh, that they can, you know, take their risks there. And it could be, uh, you know, an, an adventure where they can make their their dreams happen there. So, uh, you know, maybe you know, Larry can talk to them one on one and, and can convince them on that. There's so much funding right now. It's, it's uh, this, uh, two two last very quick questions. Uh, there's so much funding now. It's kind of hard to compete. It really is. Yeah, if you want to start a company, there's really no disincentive for people. You know, uh, a young person now to start a company. I, I just spent a lot of time with Y Combinator, and you know, the valuations they're getting, you know, are, are yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, I always say there's not enough rat holes to shove all the VC money down in Silicon Valley. Anyway, go ahead. Is there anything about um, Google itself and its culture that kind of makes the next big thing more of a threat to it than to say uh, to Yahoo or to Microsoft? Anything? Right. Well, because I guess Google wants to be the center of it, it would be. Yeah, that's like as I said before. That that's that's the threat there. They're the leader. So the next big thing makes them the target, really. So they they have to be ahead of that. And that's something that, you know, you look at the, the companies that led, they, they don't have a great track record about that. The innovator's dilemma is a tough nut to crack. Last question. Okay, I have a question because we're really you're talking about the culture and also I think you also talking about the, uh, the objective key result kind of a process. I'm curious actually if the company gets bigger and bigger, it's inevitable to have some kind of process in place. So I'm particularly interested about the balance between the freedom, the innovative culture versus the innovation process. Do they have innovation process or managing of the new product release? Those kind of things to make them kind of struck the balance between being really innovative as well right. as follow some kind of disciplines in the innovation. Yeah, they do. They have, you know, I mean, it's all about you know the measurements. They try to measure what you know how, you know, which what kind of employees and what conditions can can spring that up. You know, but really, if you think about it, it's it's almost like a you know, the, 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 the baseball draft, you know, as opposed to the football draft. The football draft, the top, you know, you, you, you pretty much know the first round people are going to be stars. The baseball draft, it, it, it turns out to be, you know, figure out which are the, the, the long shots, have the high ceiling, and win. but it's really a lot of, of, of luck there. You know, the, I suspect that the product coming out of Google this year that we're talking about three years from now, it's almost going to be, you're not going to look back and, and, and say, wow, they 